Okay, now I want to turn to a very important class of linear classifiers, which is logistic regression. So, before we talk about logistic regression, or should I say to motivate logistic regression, I want to talk about the concept of hard versus soft decision classifiers. So, consider a general binary classification problem. You're given some feature vector x, and I want to determine one of two class labels. So for example, if it's image classification, and I want to determine if an image x is a cat or a dog. And so I'll call one of these labels 0 and the other one 1. Now, in a traditional hard decision classifier, like what we discussed in the previous section, the output will be a class label. So in this case, if y hat is 1, the classifier would say the image is a dog with certainty. A soft decision classifier, in contrast, doesn't give you a hard label like the image is a cat or a dog. Instead, it gives you a softer quantity, which is the conditional probability. A probability is just a number between 0 and 1. So, for example, if it gave the number 0.9, it was saying that this image is 90% chance that it's a dog, but it's a 10% chance that it's a cat. So this is not exactly sure. In mathematical lingo, we write that as saying that the probability that y is 1 given x, the given x, because I want to emphasize that I'm making that decision after seeing the image x. All right, so we have hard decision. It makes a clear deci a decision. It's either a cat or a dog. A soft decision, it makes a decision more like a probability. Now, why would you use a soft decision classifier? Well, in most problems, classifiers make errors. Just as an example, consider go back to that MNIST dataset that I mentioned way back in Unit 1. If you recall, the MNIST dataset is a bunch of handwritten digits between 0 and 9. And the problem is to estimate which digit it is, which number it is. So, so a lot of the digits are pretty clear. But suppose I got a digit like this. And it could be a 5, you see that? But it could also be a 6. So even a human who's pretty good expert at this would not really be easy to make that decision. A hard decision classifier will look at this and make a decision and say, one way or the other, this digit is a 6, for example. But actually that error, that decision could be wrong. It turns out in this case, if you didn't guess, the digit actually is a 5. Actually, I would have guessed a 6, but it turns out that we know that the person was trying to write a 5. So even good classifiers make errors. In contrast, soft decision classifiers recognize that there is uncertainty. So for example, in this case, faced with a tough digit like this, it might not say certainly that this digit is 6. Instead it might say, well, I don't really know what it is. But I guess with about a 30% probability, it's a digit 5, and maybe a 70% probability, it's digit 6. But in this case, of course, it still wouldn't have put the most probability on the digit 6, but it recognizes that there's a chance that it makes a mistake. Now, there's two reasons why soft decision is good. First, we're going to show later that it's easier to train soft decision classifiers because they allow for errors in the training and that lets us quantify how close those classifiers are working on the training data. The other part about it is it gives a confidence measure. So, for example, in this digit, maybe it tells you only with 70% probability that the digit's 6. And if you really need to be more certain, then maybe you do something else. Maybe look at some other part of the uh, form to try to get the right answer. Now, 
Logistic modeling is one specific type of soft decision classifiers. I'm going to introduce it first in the case of binary classifier. So we have again a class label, which is either 0 or 1. Now, remember what happens in a hard decision classifier. We're going to make a decision y hat, which is also 0 or 1, and we do it in two steps. We compute a linear function of the vector x, so there are some weights and an intercept, and then if that linear function is positive, we say it's definitely class 1, and if it's negative, it's definitely class 0. So if this was our cat and dog example, the, of course x would be a very complex vector, but after doing some operations, I'm going to get to a single scale of a number, z, and whenever that number is positive, I say it's definitely a dog, and when that number is negative, I say it's definitely a cat. This is how logistic regression works. First step, I want to not compute a label, y hat, 0 or 1. Instead, I want to compute this conditional probability. It's a number between 0 and 1, but it could be any number in between. The first step is actually identical to the linear classifier. I compute a z, which is a linear function of the axis along with the intercept. But then instead of making this hard decision, I pass that z through this weird function here. This function looks like this. When z is 0, instead of giving a number, it says, well, at this point, it's only a 50-50 chance that it's a cat or a dog. When z is very positive, it becomes closer to 1. When z is very negative, it becomes closer to 0. But in between this, it has all these numbers between 0 and 1. So, for example, if z is 2, it's maybe about 87% chance, I'm just eyeballing that on this graph, that it's a dog. But it's never certain one way or the other. It gets more certain only as you go to the edges. This function is sometimes called a sigmoid. Another way to visualize this sigmoid function is to generate data from this model. So this is what this graph does. I take a bunch of data points or x values from minus 10 to 10 and then I compute the z value by scaling this with some coefficient w1. And then for each z value I randomly generate whether it's in class 0 or 1. So if you take z w1 equal to 1, you get a curve like this. You see, as x is very low, uh, sorry, as um, z is very um, negative, most of the samples become class 0. And when z is very positive, most of the class examples are 1. But there's still a chance, even when z is negative, you can have a positive sample. And when z is positive, you can still have a negative sample. And this blue line is that probability. As that weight is increased, the boundary doesn't change, but that line becomes sharper and sharper, meaning that it's harder and harder to have a negative example when z is positive and a positive example when z is negative. As w, this weight, but goes to infinity, we get back to the hard decision rule. We can also visualize the hard versus soft decision classification in 2D. So, for example, suppose you had two features, x1 and x2. We know from the linear, decision, uh, linear hard decision classifier, it separates the space into two half spaces. So, for example, in this case here, I've had one half space corresponding to the left part and the other half space corresponding to the right part. So, any samples in the right part would be labeled by a hard decision classifier as class 1 and every part sample in the left as class 0. But in this particular data, there could be errors. You can see that there are some class 0 examples in the positive part and some class 1 examples or blue examples in the negative part. 
A soft decision classifier would look more like this. You have at each point a the classifier outputs a real number between 0 and 1 corresponding to the probability. As you go more to the left, the probability goes closer to 0. As you go more to the right, the probability goes closer to 1. But in the middle region, you see that it's not that certain about the probability. It's maybe, and right at the middle, it's a half. Now, the idea of um, soft decision classifiers, and logistic classifiers in particular, are easily extended to multiple classes. To just illustrate this, suppose there are k classes, which are labeled 1 to k. They could be other, any other label too, like 0 to k minus 1. So, for example, if it was the digit problem, there'd be 10 of these classes, or maybe 26 letters, or one of many spoken words. For the multi-class classification problem, there are two parameters. The first, W, is a matrix, which is K by D, if you have D inputs and K classes. And then you also have an intercept or bias vector, which I'm calling W0, which is K-dimensional. Now, once you have these two parameters, this is what you do. You first create K linear functions. So you take your vector X and then multiply it by the matrix W and add the bias. And then you will get K output values, one for each class. These are sometimes called the scores or the logits. The second step, you pass it through another nonlinear function, which is of this form, which is called a soft max. Just to illustrate how this soft max works, let's take a simple example. Suppose you have three classes, 0, 1, and 2. And for some x, whatever that x is, you get three logic values. You always have one logic value for each class. So suppose they have minus 1, 0, and 2. I just made these up just to illustrate. OK, if you want to compute the probabilities, you first take the exponent, e to the z for each one of these. They just happen to be these three numbers, 0 0.3617.36. You can do that on your computer. And then you can compute the probabilities. So the probability that's in the first class is the first number divided by the sum of these. That's the second class is the second number divided by the um, sum of these, and so on. And in this case here, you get these three probabilities. And so if you graph them in a bar graph, they're like this, saying it's 84% chance that it's class 2. You know that corresponds to the largest score. And then it's about 11% chance it's class 1, and a 4.2% chance that it's class 0. So it's pretty high chance in this case that it would be class 2, but not impossible that's one of the other two classes. So just some properties of this soft max function. You will always have, if you have k classes, you will have k inputs, z1 to zk. Those are the k logits or k scores. And then you'll get k outputs. Now, these outputs are always like a, what you would call in probability a probability mass function, meaning that the sum of these values always sum to 1, and they're positive on, or at least non-negative, on each of the classes. So it's like a probability. 4.2%, 11.4%, and 84.4%. They all sums to 100%. Now, the term soft max comes from this property. If one of the scores or inputs is much larger than the other, you can see that that term will dominate. And you can check out, just simple math, that the probability of the function will converge to 1 on the entry where that score is largest, and it'll close to 0 on all the other scores. So it kind of picks out, if you like, the maximum value, at least when the maximum is very large. Now, even when the maximum is not much larger than the other values, it will always assign the highest probability to the class which has the highest score. So those are some simple properties 
of the soft max function. It's useful to look at the boundaries of what happens in multi-class classification. Remember that in linear class binary classification, the lit classifier divided the region into two simple half spaces. With multiple classes, it becomes a little more complicated. If you look at the parts where one probability is higher than the others, they're not really simple um, planar shapes. Instead, they're kind of these irregular shapes which are called polytopes. One final thing that I want to talk about is combining multi-class classification or binary classification with transforms. So if you remember in regression, what you can do is instead of transform um, working with directly with the vector x, you can transform it into basis functions. And just like the regression case, you can perform the logistic classification on this transformed space. So we would take a linear combination of the transformed features and then run a softmax output. Just as an example of using transformed features, let me return back to the example I talked about earlier in this unit. So suppose you have a data set which looks like A. In this case, you can see here that a linear classifier should work really well because you can draw a straight line and it separates the samples between A and B. But if you recall from that example, a linear classifier does not work well in the case of B because obviously a linear line is not going to separate the green and the blue. But in this case, after doing a transform correctly selected, you can get this kind of boundary region. So just to illustrate here, um, what I would do is I would pick my feature vector x to include the constant term x1 and x2 like a linear classifier, but I would also add two quadratic terms x1 squared and x2 squared. So now if you took the weight to be this uh, set of coefficients and you take the inner product of the weight with these features here, so you get minus r squared times 1 plus 0 times x1 plus 0 times x2 plus 1 times x1 squared plus 1 times x2 squared, I get this function here. See, z is equal to x1 squared plus x2 squared minus r squared. And you will recognize that when z is equal to 0, that is just the equation for a circle. So if the origin was here in the center, that would actually exactly describe this um, boundary. And you will get blue, or whatever the class 1 is, um, in the case when uh, you're inside the circle, and green when you're outside the circle. So the point is that you can, with um, using these features, get more complex regions. All right, in the next section, I'm going to talk about how to train these classifiers. But before doing that, remember that in the GitHub repository, we have a set of in-class exercises. I want you to try this really short one, super easy, just to make sure that you understand the basics of how to calculate probabilities. Um, check out your solution. It's also in the repository. And when you've got it right, move on to the next video.